Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Berger. So glad you could be with us today, whether you are here with us in person or worshiping with us online. We're so glad that you can gather with us around God's Word. We're nearing the end of the season of Epiphany, and Epiphany is when God reveals Jesus as our Savior. But today we flip that around, and Jesus, our Savior, reveals God to us. Everything you need will be up on the screen. We'll begin by singing two verses of hymn 82. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God. He created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are God's own dear child. May he give you strength to live according to his will. And in the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. 
Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading from God's Word today will also be our study for today's sermon. It's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 18, where God's prophet Moses prophesies that God will raise up another prophet, pointing ahead to Jesus. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. This is the word of our God. We'll join together to sing the verse of the day. <coughs> today's gospel, we see the fulfillment of the prophecy we just heard from Deuteronomy. Jesus proclaims God's word as his prophet. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the next hymn.
mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from his Son and our Savior Jesus. Amen. I'd like to study the first reading with you today. It's from Deuteronomy 18. It's printed out in the worship folder if you'd like to follow along. A prophet is someone who speaks God's word to the people. But if you go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, God originally spoke directly to the people. He spoke to Adam and Eve, to Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the time you get to Joseph, God is speaking more indirectly through dreams and visions. And then as God's people began to grow in Egypt and spent 400 years there in slavery, most of it, God eventually called Moses to be his first prophet. You might remember how God called Moses in the burning bush and told him to go back to Egypt and to tell both Pharaoh and the people what he commanded. The entire book of Deuteronomy is written at the end of Moses' 40-year ministry as prophet. It's also the end of his life. The nation of Israel is now about to enter into and conquer the promised land of Canaan. And Moses knows there are many false prophets there who will tempt God's people to worship false gods. And so Moses warns the people not to listen to those false prophets, but rather to listen to God's true prophets. And that's still his encouragement for us today. We're going to take a look especially at the first verse of the text and see how it points to Jesus as God's true prophet But then we'll also talk a little bit about the prophets or pastors that God sends to proclaim his word today. Moses' encouragement still rings true to listen to both God's prophet and God's prophets. Let's take a look at the first verse of the reading. Moses said to the people, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And then Moses reminds the people in the next verse, this is exactly what they asked for when they came out of Egypt and God appeared to them on the top of Mount Sinai. When they saw thunder and lightning and smoke and fire, they said, Moses, why don't you go talk to God and you come back and tell us what he said. They were properly afraid because they were sinful people and they knew they could not properly stand in the presence of a holy God. And so Moses served as the mediator. God told Moses what he wanted the people to know and then Moses spoke to the people. Well, now that Moses is leaving, he promises that God will send other prophets, and specifically one. This is a messianic prophecy, meaning it points ahead to the Messiah. And it's not hard for us to see how Jesus perfectly fits this description. First of all, Moses said that God would raise up this prophet. And God agreed in verse 18, actually. God said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. And I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command. It's God who sent Jesus to proclaim his word to us. We rightly say that Jesus came willingly, but Jesus himself often said that he was sent by his Father. And God raised up Jesus as prophet from among the people, from among the Israelites. On the one hand, Jesus was a Jew, and he proclaimed God's word mainly to fellow Jews, to the the nation of Israel. On the other hand, God raised up Jesus from among his human brothers, And Jesus also proclaims God's word to all people. Like Moses, Jesus was a mediator. In fact, Moses not only functioned as prophet speaking for God to the people, Moses also spoke for the people to God. Usually sinful people cannot speak to God. God allowed Moses to do that. But Jesus is the more perfect mediator because he is both holy God and fully, but not sinful, human. And then Jesus functioned like a prophet. Jesus didn't come primarily to preach and teach God's word. He came mainly to save us from our sins. But during his three-year ministry, Jesus often was found preaching and teaching, sometimes on a hillside, sometimes on the side of a lake. And as we hear in our gospel reading today, often on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. 
Whenever Jesus went to the synagogue, he was invited to speak. Jesus, first of all, proclaimed, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. That's what we heard last week. But he also went through the Old Testament scriptures, which most of the people knew very well, and he pointed out how he was the fulfillment of every Old Testament promise and prophecy. And the people recognized that Jesus taught with a different authority than their usual teachers of the law. Obviously. Because Jesus wasn't just proclaiming the word of God that was given to him. He was proclaiming God's word as God himself. And he showed that by his miracles, including the one we see in our gospel reading today. He casts out an impure spirit. And the people said, look at the authority. He even tells spirits what they do and they obey him. Unfortunately, many people still rejected Jesus as both prophet and Messiah or Savior. But there were some. There were some who recognized that Jesus was the prophet about whom Moses spoke and that he was even the Messiah who had come to save them, not just from impure spirits on earth, but from the devil and sin itself. And so they listened to him. And still today, Moses encourages us to listen to God's prophet. To put our faith in Jesus and to see how he is the one that God promised to send. How he came as both God and man to defeat the devil for us. To pay for our sins and promise us an eternal life to come. But Jesus is no longer walking the earth preaching and teaching. So now he sends others on his behalf. At first, Jesus, just before he ascended into heaven, he sent out his disciples. They became apostles, and Jesus told them to preach the good news to the ends of the earth and all creation. Well, now Jesus gives what we call pastors. And we could include teachers and many others, but today we're going to focus a little bit on the role of a pastor. I want you to see how a pastor partially fits the same description. First of all, that God raises up pastors. It's the Holy Spirit who gives a man the desire or ability to proclaim God's word to his people. And God raises up pastors from among the people. I asked Pastor Albrecht and he reminded me that it's Robert Romberg who has come from this congregation that serves as a pastor. John Giddings and Daniel Albrecht currently serve as teachers. We heard last week how Brooke Flunker is also preparing to serve as a Lutheran teacher. God wants us to find more people from among us to encourage to serve in the ministry. In fact, Pastor Albrecht encouraged that everyone consider that. And I'll take it a step further, not just the young people, but even those of you who are already in a career. You know that every year there are men who are 10, 20, or 30 years into a career, and they leave behind that career, they move their families to New Orleans, Minnesota, they go to college again, and then they have to move to Mequon and go to the seminary again, and then they become a pastor. It's a second career pastor. They're often some of the best pastors that we have because of their previous life experience and experience in whatever career they pursued earlier. But not everyone has the desire or the abilities. And even those who do, do not get to say, well, I want to serve this group of people in that location. When we graduate from the seminary, we don't say, well, you know what? I've always wanted to live by the ocean in Florida, so I'm going to find a congregation down there. Or I'd really like to be on on the the West Coast, so I'm going to find a congregation over there. No, it's God who raises up prophets and calls them to serve his people. The way that works in our synod is through the divine call. When we graduate, all we do is present ourselves for service. And there are some congregations who are willing to accept a new guy, a graduate, as their pastor. And so the district presidents, who are responsible for putting people in the right spots, they look at the congregations and their needs. They look at the pastors and their abilities. And the teachers, this is the same thing for teachers, and they match them up. After that first assignment, the pastor or teachers can receive a call from other congregations. So 26, 7 years ago, St. Paul's called Pastor Albrecht, who was currently serving churches in Marquette and Manchester, Wisconsin. About six and a half years ago, the congregation called me to serve while I was teaching at Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School. 
And more recently, I received a call from a church in Minnesota to come and serve them. At that time, we look at what the congregation's needs are and what they're asking us to do. We look at our personal gifts and abilities, and we ask God to help guide us so that we can serve his people best. But really, regardless of where we serve, the job is mostly the same. Pastors serve as prophets of the prophet. Our job is to proclaim God's word to his people. But notice I said our job is to proclaim God's word. My job is not to tell you what I think, to share my opinions or my ideas. Our job as pastors is simply to tell you this is what God said. In fact, if we don't, we have to answer to God. Look at verse 20. A prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. If I proclaim to you something other than what God has recorded for us in Scripture, then I am responsible to God. Or if I fail to proclaim to you everything that God has recorded in Scripture, I am responsible to God. Now you probably remember from catechism or from some other good Lutheran study that there are two main teachings in the Bible. On the one hand, God asks us to proclaim his law. The law is simply what God tells us we should do and what we shouldn't do. But with the law also comes a warning that when we do evil or we fail to do good, we sin and for our sin we deserve suffering now and into eternity as we often confess. That means it's my responsibility to warn God's people when they're not regularly hearing God's word or receiving the sacrament of communion. It's my job to warn parents when they're not teaching their children God's word at home or bringing them to church. It's our responsibility as pastors to point out sin, especially when they're repeated, regular, or habitual, like lying or stealing or adultery or living together outside of marriage. It's our difficult responsibility to tell guests that not everybody is invited to Holy Communion. In fact, I'm not sure people realize that we don't even invite all of our own members to communion. You have to be confirmed before you're invited. And that's because God's word clearly says that you can take communion more to your harm than to your benefit. It's our difficult responsibility to warn people about supporting or participating in false teaching organizations like the Scouts, or Ringing Bells for the Salvation Army, or the Masons, and a number of others. Now you might notice, I said those are all uncomfortable. Because usually when we approach people and say, hey, we haven't seen you in church for a while. Or we haven't seen the kids. Or it sounds like you might be living in some kind of sin or participating in one of these organizations. People get angry. And they get mad at us. Sometimes they even leave the church. And they might say, who do you think you are? And the answer is, I'm just a prophet. I'm just a messenger. Trust me, the easy way out would be to ignore all of these issues. But God commands us to preach the law because God does not want his people to suffer or live in eternal punishment because of their sin. And so with God, we proclaim the law praying that his people will repent of their sin and turn to him for forgiveness. And then we get the privilege of proclaiming the second main teaching of the Bible, which is the gospel. And simply put, the gospel is the good news that Jesus is our Savior from sin. I get to tell you that even though you could never live up to God's holy standards, Jesus did. Even though you could never pay for even one sin that you've committed, Jesus did. Even though none of us have the strength, really, to deal with life in this sinful world, Jesus does. And even though we could never overcome death on our own, Jesus did that too. Every week, we get to tell you that Jesus lived a perfect life in your place. That he died on the cross to take away all of your sins. That he rose from the dead and promises there is a life without sin and its consequences. And while you're still here, he's going to give you strength to get through every single day until he brings you home to heaven. It is our privilege to proclaim 
God's gospel. Your job, then, is to listen. Moses puts it pretty simply. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. You must listen to him. God himself says in verse 19, I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. As long as we are proclaiming God's word to you, if you reject us, if you say, Pastor, you know what, that's old-fashioned and nobody lives that way anymore, or Pastor, you know, these groups, they really help a lot of people, so we're going to ignore the false teaching, or Pastor this, or Pastor that, you're not really rejecting us. Sometimes it feels that way to us, but in reality, as long as we're proclaiming God's word, you would be rejecting God's word. On the other hand, when you say, Pastor, thank you for pointing that out, I repent of my sin, and I get to announce forgiveness, and I get to offer strength and comfort from God's word, that's, that's no credit to me. I'm just the messenger. But it is my privilege to tell you that God loves you, and that God forgives you, and that God wants the best for you now and into eternity. So listen to God's prophet. You know that you get to listen to Jesus speak to you directly, maybe not with a sound like Adam and Eve or Cain and Abel or Abraham, but every time you open your Bible to read God's word, Jesus himself speaks to you. If you read Genesis with us, and maybe Mark, now we're reading Isaiah, I'd encourage you to keep doing that. And if you don't really have time to read the Bible on your own, then get an app so somebody else can read it to you while you're driving or while you're working. And then give us the chance to proclaim God's word to you, to listen to God's prophets. Continue to do what you're doing right now to come back every week to hear God speak to you. But understand this difference. The main purpose of worship is to worship God. And part of that is listening to God's word as it's proclaimed to us. But Bible study gives us a chance to actually dig deep and apply that word to our life. Come to Bible study. Come and hear how God wants to speak to you, not just for a little bit of time, but for a deeper time so that you can live according to his will all throughout the week and find his strength in that. And even beyond those public gatherings, give us the opportunity to proclaim God's word to you in more personal situations. Tell us when you're in the hospital so we can come and share God's word with you. Of course, we're here to do weddings and funerals, but maybe before the funeral, you want somebody to come and to offer God's word as you prepare to say goodbye to a loved one. Maybe you're just having trouble in your marriage or parenting or just life in general is hard. So Come and let us share God's word with you in a more personal, one-on-one -on -one basis. Don't worry about whether we're too busy or not, because we're never too busy to function as a prophet. Our job is to speak God's word to his people. I wish that God would still speak to us directly. He does that through scripture, but otherwise God speaks now through people, through pastors. Come and listen. Listen to God's prophet and listen to God's prophets. Jesus reminds us that his words are spirit and they are life. And the more you listen and the more you hear, the more life that Jesus gives you. And may he give it to you abundantly. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God transcends our human understanding. I pray it will guard your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join with me in confessing our Christian faith. Today we'll use the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. While we take a few moments to meditate on the word that we have just heard, I'll also invite you to take out your electronic devices, go to stpaulsfamily.com slash register, let us know that you're here. If you don't have a device with you today, then if you get home and you're able to do that on your computer, we'd certainly appreciate that. Thank you. At this time, I'll invite any of our councilmen to come forward. Mark, I see you back there. Gary, if you want to come up, Dave. On the back of your bulletin, you can see yeah, Matt, You can see all of the men who have agreed to serve our church as leaders, and you can see the positions that they are filling. We will install them at this time. Dear brothers in Christ, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus liberated you from sin and death and made you members of his body, the church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith, and you have now been selected for positions of leadership to our Lord on behalf of this congregation. The Lord seeks faithfulness from all who serve. As scripture says, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. But the Lord does not seek from us what he has not given to us. You are servants of Jesus Christ and now workers in this congregation. As such, we ask that you would set examples for your own families and for the entire congregation. Make God's word your foundation and guide, and search it daily for comfort and instruction. And now, so that the congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God and the congregation, will you diligently and faithfully carry out the office entrusted to you according to the ability which God has given you? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I now install you as councilmen of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God grant you the Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out your duties to his glory and for the good of his people. Members of St. Paul's, I urge you to regard these brothers as servants of Jesus and gifts to our church. Pray for them, support them in their service, and help them so that through the gospel ministry of our congregation, more people may be reached for Christ and his kingdom. Go then and give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And we thank you for your service. You may return to your seats. I invite the congregation to stand for prayer. Lord God, you promised to send a prophet to speak God's word to us, in the past, you sent many prophets, like Moses, to speak to your people. Now you send pastors and teachers to proclaim your word to us. Forgive us when we do not listen to your prophets. Forgive us when we don't take time to learn or study your word on our own. And forgive us when we, we reject the word that you have given your prophets to proclaim, or when we live contrary to that word. 
Lord Jesus, you came as the one true prophet to reveal God to us. You revealed his love and desire to forgive us. And you offered yourself as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And you now send parents, pastors, teachers, and others to continually assure us of your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear the word that your prophets proclaim. Lead us to repent of our sins, trust in your forgiveness, and live according to your will. Great Physician, we also come to you today on behalf of our sister Mary Benach as she prepares for surgery. Restore health to her body while also giving strength to her soul. Comfort her family so that they too may support and encourage her. We also pray for the family of Dorothy Nimmer. We thank you for the life that you gave her while she was here with us on earth and for the life you now have given her in heaven. Continue to comfort her family with your promises of life and resurrection and reunion for all who die with faith in Jesus. Merciful and gracious God, we also ask you to send your spirit into the hearts of your servants, our councilmen, that they may carry out their duties with diligence, boldness, and wisdom. We ask all this in the name of our Savior Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. You may be seated for our final hymn, number 333. Almighty God, you divide the day from the night, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet in the way of peace. And having done your will with cheerfulness while it is day, grant that when evening comes, we may rejoice in giving thanks to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Once again, good morning and welcome to all of you. A special welcome to guests who are with us 
to those worshiping with us online, uh, to those of you who uh, sloshed through this, the snow this morning, certainly appreciate it. There's really nothing more encouraging to a prophet or a pastor than when God's people come to hear his word. We encourage you, as I said in the, in the sermon, to come to Bible study. We've got two options on Sunday mornings, one upstairs, one downstairs, Thursday morning at 9.30. And on days like this where we have just a little bit of extra time before we get started, we'd invite you to come and have a donut downstairs or grab a cup of coffee. There's usually coffee upstairs and downstairs. Uh, spend a little time uh, to get in touch with your fellow believers and then stick around to get more in touch with God and His Word as well. Uh, there is a newsletter for February on the table in the back, out in the, the, the fellowship area there, and uh, the table also back here by the back stairs. They're not in the boxes, so we'd encourage you to take one of those with you unless you read it online. If you're married, you'll notice there's an invitation in there for our fourth annual anniversary celebration. Uh, even uh, with COVID, we had enough people say that they were interested in coming to the meal. It's, uh, it's like going to a wedding reception. It's just that we're celebrating your marriage. So we'd love to have you come and join us at the Bridgewood on Friday, March 12th at 6.30 p.m. There's an invite in the newsletter. You can find more information there. Uh, also on the back, uh, there's a notice that I had received a call to serve at St. John in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. You can mark that call returned. So if you're willing to have me, I'll be staying with you for a little while longer. And it is our privilege to share God's word with you. Uh, Pastor Albert and I would certainly ask that you continue to pray for our ministry, pray for our council, and get involved in our ministry so that we can continue to proclaim God's word to more people that everyone can have the life that Jesus offers. God be with you throughout the week. Mm -hmm.